Welcome back to the Prepare Like a Pro live chat show. My name is Jack McLean. I am the host and I'm lucky enough to have JB Morin as our guest today. JB is a real expert when it comes to sprinting. He's the head of sports science and physical education department at the University of St. Etienne in France, a member of a university laboratory of human movement biology and associate researcher with the Sports Research Institute New Zealand Sprints at Auckland University Technology. He's obtained a track and field national diploma in 1998 and a PhD in human locomotion and performance in 2004. JB's field of research is mainly around human locomotion and performance with a specific interest in running biomechanics, maximal power movements, i.e. sprints and jumps, he has a edited textbook, Biomechanics of Training and Testing in spring in 2018, and published over 150 peer-reviewed scientific papers. Before we start tonight's episode, our mission here at Prepare Like a Pro is to empower aspiring athletes and staff with practical knowledge from some of the industry's most inspiring individuals and to strengthen the AFL community. If you like the show, please show your support by following us on Instagram and subscribing to the podcast. We're on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube. Uh, welcome, JB. Thanks for tuning in, mate. Thanks, Jack. And uh, thank you for inviting me. Really, really good pleasure. Yeah, we're very uh, grateful to have you on. And let's um, dive right into the beginning of your journey, your story. Um, where did you, at what age did you discover you had a passion for um, biomechanics, sprinting, and, and performance? Well, I guess the, I guess the passion came with my own practice uh, when I was young and um, asking questions about how to run faster because uh, it was not that fast. I was practicing uh, football and middle distance running. And then I yep. went down to uh, track events like 400 and 400 hurdles. And so I had a deficit in speed and I wanted to uh, discover how uh, to train to run faster. That was the beginning. And then very quickly you go to biomechanics and physiology and uh, so I started studying that at the university and um, I think my first protocol was in 2000 so that's almost 20 years of uh, diving into better understanding the mechanics of sprinting and and better understanding the methods to develop it yeah sure Let, let's let's dive into some of those details like you mentioned you focused on improving your speed so before going into biomechanics so what type of things did you play around with in your own training to improve your speed back then so the very funny thing is that um i was not very much into into gym-based strength and conditioning yep. and i think that was a major mistake in my in my <laughs> in my uh development but um i dived into the technical part of sprinting the how how do you run and is that connected to how fast you run? And then I later discovered the interest of uh, specific strength training, well, general strength training and then specific strength training because my main limitation, I guess, was the force side of my, of my profile, my spectrum, not much more than the velocity side. And so yeah, that was the, that was the, 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 the start of the, of the thinking. And uh, you know, people say we, we can make people faster we cannot make people fast because there's a huge, you know, genetic component in being fast or not at the beginning. But uh, a common uh, uh, training mistake is to think that nobody can improve in terms of speed. Anybody can improve. The, the, the only question is how and to what extent. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you like it is something that we do hear about in the industry. Not don't bother with sprinting mechanics. Don't bother with trying to get an athlete faster. It's a genetic thing. Um, spend your time elsewhere. Where do you think that has stemmed from? And, and why do you think it is a, uh, I wouldn't say it's a common belief, but it's certainly a belief. I don't know. I think honestly, what I saw in my experience, <clears throat> much more coaches are okay, competent, experienced with uh, classical and gym-based SNC. Yeah. And, and very few coaches are experienced and competent with speed training, very specific speed training, because uh, it was historically only the track coaches. And so mm. I think many, many coaches um, stated that uh, people cannot get faster just because, in fact, they didn't really know uh, for mm. themselves how to make people faster. And I think this is 
uh, changing under the influence of uh, elite track coaches who who are doing some you know teaching courses and so on. Uh, and my my kind of dream or expectations in the industry is that the amount of energy and time and knowledge that has been spent on developing the strength, the maximum force, and gym based slash weightlifting uh, you know environment is spent yeah. on track field uh, sprinting because uh, if you take even research uh, research on training methods has been very 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 much in the strength direction which is totally okay and good and uh, we 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 haven't been that far in the speed direction and I think that's that's the next uh, steps yeah and you're certainly leading the way mate so it's it's exciting to hear that from someone like yourself um, and I, I know actually in my own journey in the industry which is about 11 years now I, I would be a testament to that I was definitely spent a lot more time in the gym as a personal trainer um, working with your clients and then you start working with athletes and that's the area that you're you're confident with yeah. you're confident with so you, so you start to transfer that uh, and until I worked in um, with like like you mentioned uh, track and field like I was lucky enough to be mentored by Andrew Russell who had a track and field background and and sprinting background and that's where you start to see it and once you see it you start to see the the benefits that sprinting has um, and the crossover that it can that it can do and it's it is powerful and the the audience has to be very very careful in not over interpreting my my uh, words i don't say that gym is not necessary or should be avoided i just say that very likely it shouldn't be the first button you press and yeah. it's it's a button you should press with good reasons so for example if you if you give me an athlete and you say try to make him faster or try to make her faster my number one button will be let's go and run and see what see yeah. what you got then, yeah. depending on what I see and what we diagnose and so on, we might spend more time at the gym than on the track. Mm -hmm. But it will totally depend on the athlete. And so yeah. I, I guess the industry has been too much over, okay, you want to run faster? Let's go and do the gym program. This is, I think this is a basic uh, uh, mistake sometimes. Yeah. And, and it stems from, um, unless you have a track and field experience, you... you you, you only know what you know, so you're confident in the gym. You, you, that's what you understand, uh, and therefore that's what is happening yeah. with athletes. I think many, many, it's 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 really improving now. But overall, um, SNC coaches have uh, dealing with the sprinting people. I mean, you know, people dealing mm. with people sprinting, they have more uh, mm. experience overall uh, with gym oriented things than, uh, track and, and, and sprinting oriented things just because of their own personal pathway. Um, they have yeah. all experienced a degree of, uh, of gym work and many of them have not experienced a good, a good amount of sprinting, uh, which makes the difference in my opinion. Yeah. And in, in your discovery early on, as when you're in the, um, in your athlete phase of your, of your journey, going back to to that period, you mentioned how you, you quickly turned to the biomechanics side of things. Take us through your mindset back then, and, and what what, we, what was the the um, the light bulb moment? Was it? What, did you see a practitioner that was really good with biomechanics? Were you reading some research? Like, where did you start to notice that biomechanics is where you're going to spend some any time and energy on? Yeah, so it was partly due to research because uh, research pretty quickly showed that. It was not like it was not like endurance training, a matter of physiology. It was really a matter of how the force is produced and how the force is applied. And so, yeah. and the, the questions came uh, like, uh, how do you produce more force in that very fast context? Uh, what mm -hmm. muscles are involved? How do they work? And in turn, uh, what exercises should you use to specifically develop what what you what you are aiming at developing? So. Uh, that was first, and the second was the influence of my uh, of my university and lab. I had people around me uh, analyzing sports with biomechanical uh, lens, so so yeah. that that's where I connect the dots. But again, I, I think the saying. research. Uh, sorry, at the moment I started my thesis, the research on sprinting physiology was into uh, brain oxygenation, so very 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 deep into the, you know the mechanisms, and the research yeah. on sprinting 
there was almost no uh, field direct measurement of force output during a 100 meter run. So it was very basic that the, the, the amount of knowledge was really, really imbalanced. So right. I, I saw a gap of knowledge to fill. Yeah, fantastic. And, and it obviously was something that you're passionate about, which is uh, a, good, a good match. And in terms of mentors and influences, um, when you started going from the athlete to a, to a practitioner mode, who were some strong influences? So there were, there were some coaches uh, in France who were uh, video analyzing the athletes. And so yep. they are not internationally renowned, but they are really, really uh, well known in France for that, you know, frame by frame, very detailed analysis of the running technique. And um, on the biomechanics side, I was really influenced by my uh, PhD supervisor, um, who was a doctor, medical doctor, Professor Di Prompero in Italy, because yep. he was trying to analyze the locomotion and uh, energetic cost or the biomechanics with a very, very big picture first approach. Like uh, what does a human body need to produce, to run fast? You know, very mm -hmm. rough, basic, uh, Newtonian laws of motion approach to then yeah. dig deeper into what muscles, uh, what training parts and so on. Because I think that's the, from the big picture down to the training exercise is the good way to go. Uh, and yeah. not, not the problem from a very, very narrow perspective first, like, you know, um, muscle fibers or typology and so on. Let's first look at the movement, the, the requirements, and then go into uh, uh, more detailed uh, scales. And there'd be a lot of strength and conditioning coaches tuning in that are listening to this and, and taking notes, no doubt. Um, what would be some practical tips that you found on improving a athlete's um, max velocity? So the max, well, I think max velocity is influenced by two, two factors. First is the ability to generate that max velocity, so to go there, it's not, max velocity is not something that happens, you know, uh, alone, it's acceleration to max velocity. And so if you are able to accelerate more and your body is able to produce more uh, speed, you will be faster, that's first. For example, when you pull someone, uh, almost everybody is able to run faster. When you, when you help me produce this, this extra force in acceleration, eventually I will run faster. So yeah. the idea is to not separate acceleration from top speed because they are really, you know, interrelated. And the second thing is, how do you run and how your body is uh, touching the ground and breaking or not? Because max velocity is just a matter of reducing the amount of braking forces and impulses. So in the way you run, the, uh, how fast your foot is approaching the ground and how strong your uh, force production will be is key. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to attack the ground very powerfully, produce a very high amount of force and do that in a very, very, very small amount of time, which is, this is crazy. When you run at your top speed, you're in the context where you produce the highest force in the minimum amount of time in any other type of exercise. There is no exercise yeah. biometrics, whatever, that matches yeah. this short time slash high force uh, context that you have at top speed. And so eventually when the, the first way to go to improve top speed, in my opinion, is to uh, teach your body to go there frequently and, and try to um, you know, uh, repeat this kind of stimulus. Uh, I see many, many coaches or programs aiming at improving top speed and containing many, many, many type of, you know, exercises, stuff, situations that are totally uh, not top speed uh, relevant. You see what I mean? So yeah. first things yeah, first. Yeah. No, and it's, no it's, it's a no-brainer. When you try to develop maximum strength, it's a no-brainer. You do maximum mm. strength, heavy loads. You see what I mean? So we should yeah. have exactly this no-brainer approach for maximum speed. And um, so straight away, we, we start to think, okay, how do we do that without breaking the athletes? Um, so what would be some ways that you can bring up, uh, almost uh, expose your athletes that maybe they haven't, um, like footballers and soccer players, um, that 
you know, they hit 90%, 95% of max velocity re regularly. They do a lot of acceleration work, like you said, um, but the max velocity is something they don't do regularly. In, in the off season and pre-season where we, we're not playing games and we've got time with these athletes, what would be some of the early ways that you, early um, methods that you'd use? Is, is it flying efforts, like a, you know, a gradual acceleration period and then hitting your velocity and then really winding down? Or is it like a hundred meter sprinter would do it where you do hold close to high velocities for a long period of time? What, what do you think's a good way yeah, that's to a, that's expose a, that? That's a, yeah, that's a key question because um, if you want to expose your, your body to the high speed you know, constraints, you have to be really above 90% of your maximum speed and you have to verify that. Because most of the time, uh, you think that the athletes reach their maximum speed and that's okay. And when you check the GPS data, it's not. Mm -hmm. I have seen some sprinting sessions where the objective was uh, high speed. You see many, many, many accelerations, but you don't see any meter above 90% of the top speed. So this is very important. And the second thing I think is, yes, you need to teach the athletes how to go there uh, close to maximum speed without hitting the maximum speed button because mm -hmm. they need to be super fast with a very good you know, control of their movements and, 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 and um, awareness about their movements. Otherwise, if you ask for pure maximum performance, like you, you rank the athletes, you time them, it's, it's, a, it's an event, it's a race, their yeah. objective will change. They will go from a mechanical proficiency objective to a pure performance objective. And in that case, mm -hmm. uh, they might end up with, uh, you know, uh, unsafe uh, running patterns and so on. So it's very, very important. And so, for example, maximum acceleration maybe is not to be recommended if the objective is maximum speed and vice versa. So yes, gradually, gradually increase in speed until a 10, 20 meter window with very good technique. That's, that's the idea. But yes, you need to be very careful in how you, you coach and cue the all out or almost all out, but very well controlled button. This is, in my opinion, this yeah. is key. This is why sometimes I hear soccer coaches say, okay, we've read the research. We are going to improve the exposure. So they are going to sprint more, sprint more often. Yes, but if you sprint more, in an mm. all-out and rubbish pattern and uncontrolled way, that might be very counterproductive. So you have to be very careful yeah. with this uh, control of your of your pattern. And like you said, it is a um, it's an art form, isn't it? Like a track and field coach would know how to how to manage speed exposures, how much recovery is required in between, how well the athlete's moving, um, which is incredibly hard because they're moving so fast um, without, you know, looking at camera. But so your coach's eye, it, there's probably no ch more challenging movement than than max velocity. Um, but then also uh, how to expose the athlete safely to it as well. Um, so, so to help the athletes that are tuned into this podcast, um, what, what, what you're saying for what I'm understanding is if you're going to, if your goal is max velocity, we want to try and build into that max velocity over a longer distance rather than a really hard acceleration. Um, and then because acceleration is so important for an athlete on a different day, or maybe in their warm ups leading up to max velocity, they, they can do their hard accelerations. Is that? Yeah, honestly, I would, I would summarize that by saying that if you want to develop both correctly, because the frontier between, it's not like a, a car with gears, like you have the acceleration gear and then boom, the top speed gear. It's a spectrum. It's, you know, yeah. after two or three steps, you're already at 50% of your maximum speed. So, but if you want to very um, uh, efficiently focus on each part, I think you have to, to train them separately. So to focus on all out acceleration and correct technique, but not top speed after that and vice versa. And of course, if you have team sport athletes, they might benefit more in the game from acceleration uh, development. If you have track athletes, they need both. But in terms of objective and queuing, uh, it, it has to be separated because the athletes cannot focus on, on two very different things within the same effort and within the same trial. So you're going to go all out for the acceleration and then you're going to go... Uh, 
very well technically and uh, with a very good posture on the top speed. Yep. And then from the, for the coach's point of view, and giving feedback to athletes, um, do you like to focus on internal cues, external cues? How many cues do you like to give an athlete? It, I know it's a very general question, but when it comes to, yeah. to speed and power training. Yeah, so you have to be very careful with uh, how the athlete reacts to internal or, or external cues. Uh, I, yeah. I can recommend the works of Nick Winkelman on that. That's really, you know, an amazing uh, um, book and, and coaching reference. And uh, the idea is to, in my opinion, the idea is to use uh, high-speed cameras and, and, and today's iPhones and iPads slow motion because most of the athletes, by definition, when they, they don't run, let's say, correctly, even if that's a, that's a two-day discussion, what is correct, um, yeah. they don't realize exactly the way they run. For example, if you have an athlete with a very forward inclined trunk when they run and you ask them, do you think your trunk is you know, upright or forward or backward oriented? Most of them don't have the ability to correctly uh, describe what they did. So filming them in slow motion is very, very helpful. Uh, it has to be used correctly because you don't want them to watch their own videos more than they train, of course. Yeah. I, you don't want yeah. to be extreme there, but sometimes it's, I think it's more powerful to show the athletes what they did rather than just you with your own words describing uh, their body posture. So I think, and now it's very, very easy to implement this kind yeah. of thing. So I think it's, it's a powerful feedback. Absolutely. And then the cues yeah, is, so the cues is, uh, is one at a time. You, you, don't, you, you cannot change everything at, at the same time. It's going to be a long process and you want to change and to fix correctly one thing at a time. Because more, very often, for example, if you say uh, fix that trunk position, that's going to be another thing that will be uh, you know, uh, compensated that you didn't want. So it's very, very uh, you know, step by step. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Nick, Nick Wickerman, I, I was lucky enough to be at his ASCA conference a couple of years ago. And yeah, for strength and conditioning coaches that are tuned in, definitely write down his name and look at his research and um, the power of, of external cues for when athletes are moving fast. Um, he puts it in really nicely and um, makes it really easy to understand, as well as giving plenty of practical ones to use. Uh, you, you mentioned the, the technical aspect and what is correct. Uh, for an athlete and obviously there's a lot of variance and, and Usain Bolt comes to mind on this topic uh, about what is you know optimal and and, op and you know and performance as well um, and obviously there's a lot of individual variances how do you when you're working with an athlete and they're, maybe they're a developing athlete um, how much do you try and change when it comes to like the lower limb the trunk uh, head position uh, use of arms. What are things that you that are really really important? Like your key pillars, where you like, I can't let them yeah. go. They're, they're they're too critical. And what are some things that you've seen other coaches do, or maybe you've done years ago, where you feel like it's the the effort that goes into changing that is too great, and it's better, and it's hard to change for that individual. So first, I guess the idea is that um, every athlete will have a <clears throat> a different a different dashboard and a different puzzle to solve. So yeah. I don't, I don't want some general rules like uh, every athlete should have that kind of position and so on, but I want to analyze each athlete's profile to say, okay, where is the limiting factor? I think it's uh, the, the very important thing is where is uh, the limiting factor and where is something to be fixed? Typically, um, if the athlete has, uh, I don't know, a head posture uh, that doesn't seem you know, uh, classical, that's not a good reason for uh, trying to change it because again, changing something might uh, result in other things uh, changing. So if this head posture is an issue, like you see that the head is rotating too much during sprinting and this is associated with the rotation of the trunk, then this might be associated with more tension in some muscles. You have yep. some good reasons to fix it. So first, um, how is my athlete running? what is the big rocks of his running style that needs to be fixed and how yep. can we fix it? And so again, that's, that's, that's more difficult. It's, it's a very difficult way to, to coach when you have this individualized approach, but you, you never see two guys on the team running exactly the same. 
So, mm. so that, that's very important. Uh, you can take many other examples. I think there are some common features, uh, trunk position, uh, pelvic control position and, and, and try to avoid uh, drops in the pelvis during the, 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 the strike cycle. Foot yep. position at touchdown. I mean, foot and limb position at touchdown is a very important one because it's related to the orientation of the ground force vector. So it means yes. here it's not, it's not a matter of style and preference. It's not aesthetic. It's mechanical. If your foot <laughs> touches the ground, this far in front of your center of mass, by definition, the force orientation of the ground force will be backwards. So there's going to be a negative impulse to handle. And so this is not a matter of choice or coach's eyes. It's a matter of mechanics. If you reduce that distance, you will very likely reduce the negative impulse. And this is where biomechanical analysis come in. And and like if, if, if someone is um, overstriding and, and you want to try and uh, improve their, their rhythm with, it, with their sprinting uh, and their cadence, is it doing mm -hmm. it walking first and then jogging? And, and are you giving them video feedback after a set? Is it after a rep? Or is it after the end of the session? Like yeah. how, how, how much feedback do you give an athlete? And um, what, what's the, that? The what funny way... Like? The funny way to handle that is to say to the athletes, try to overtry less. You see what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. I know that. It's like, you know, when you, you play the darts and you hit too much on the right and your friend says, okay, you try to hit more, more on the left next time. So, okay, I know that, you know. So yeah. the Keep idea is not to... Yeah, of course. If I knew how yeah. to do that, I would not hit the target, you know. So the idea is to try to have some training drills and situations where the instruction, the, the, the factor that you want to correct will be corrected by the exercise itself. So for example, right. I think that running with uh, very, very uh, small wickets can be a good way. And the other thing is mm -hmm. trying to coach and cue some more active uh, uh, backward movement of the swing leg. And so there you need some very intense backward movements that begins at the hip the problem of over striding is that the the the, the foot position is that it's just the final result of the entire process that starts at the hip right and so if you understand that and this has been wonderfully uh, shown by uh, ken clark in a paper named whip from the hip mm -hmm. if you understand that foot position at touchdown is not the real issue it's the consequence of the real issue. You understand that the issue is at the, we call that the leg switch or the hip, you know, switch movement that is not powerful enough, that is not fast enough. So you need to find some drills. You need to find some exercises where the, the hip extension will be a bit faster on one side and the hip flexion will be a bit faster on the other side. So you want the athlete to have a, you know, a hip switch that's much more powerful. So like, not, uh, getting this on the not, yeah, the, this will maybe not be um, achieved by just saying uh, hit the ground with your foot closer to your center of mass projection. This is a wrong cue, in my opinion. This will be the result of the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and that so that so um, in terms of drills that to to help strengthen that hip extension. Um, you've got like your A marches and A skips and, and like maybe figure four switches on the wall. Are they some helpful things to do to practice? Yeah. That? Yeah. Yeah. Blend, um, you know, and... knee dribbling, uh, very, very intense knee dribbling, uh, extending limbs, uh, uh, skips and so on. But again, mm -hmm. you can take the very same drill and depending on the instructions have a totally different stimulus. Take the A skip. That's the, you know, it's the A skip because it's one of the most common. You can have mm -hmm. an, an A skip drill that is done with a very powerful hip flexion, but a hip extension that is, you know, like, you know, loose. Yeah. Or yeah. you can have exactly the opposite. The rhythm is totally opposite. You can have a very loose hip flexion and then a super powerful hip extension. That's the exact same drill, but that's mm. two opposite instructions you give. So I think it's not a matter of drill selection. Well, it is, of course, but within, yeah. within the hip extension drills, it's also a matter of where is the intention? 
when should I hit the power button? And this is very important. And this is why you cannot coach by email saying, okay, do 10 times A skips because they might be done totally inefficiently. Yeah. And, and like as an external, external cue, um, if we put our cap on from Nick Wickelman, could you have like a, a hammer lift? Like if you're trying to get a nail and you're trying to get that, you're, you're trying to get the nail straight into the wood from with one go, you're going to have a high hammer lift opposed to, and that's for the knee. Um, yeah. Instead so, of doing lots of little, little drills. Yeah, that, 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 that analogy makes sense to me, but it's only partial because if you have that nail analogy, uh, how do you hit a nail with a hammer? The intense movement is at the beginning, and then when you hit the nail, everything mm, stops by definition. Yeah. So it's also typically when you hit the nail, you need to push it down. And so this is why the hammer, the hammer is a good cue, but it's only partial. So I, want, I will use a cue in which step number one is taking your foot to the ground, and step number two is taking your body uh, out of the ground forward or, or, or upwards. You see what I mean? So yes, the hammer is yes. a good analogy, but um, um, everything that is important is what the, the, the foot does when it's onto the ground, not only just yeah. before, but it's no, a good yeah, way to- just that contact. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I like that. That's, uh, it's a good visual. And um, yeah, thank you for, for clarifying uh, that that drill and then the use of, yeah. of video analysis as, as well like that's so important so you, you, you're doing your drills you're then applying it to the actual task itself like like sprinting um yeah. and in terms of getting um you know for some that might be tuned in you, how much are you focusing on like the you know lengthening some body parts and things like that like how much is the body the issue of not being able to hit those shapes and those joint angles or, or in your experience with working with athletes is it more the understanding of what that motion should feel like and changing that pattern like is it more neurology or do you or do you feel like there is some tissue stuff to work on to be able to hit, hit those angles so yeah sometimes sometimes the limiting factor is range of motion sometimes the limiting factor is is ankle range of motion sometimes it's um, pelvis and thigh uh, range of motion so again um I, I give you a very simple example. You have some. You have an athlete that is very limited in his uh, 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 range of motion at the at the thighs and the and the hip, you know, joint. Um, mm. You can test that with a very simple, you know, a standing leg raise or or a lying leg raise test and so on. Mm -hmm. And if you if you see that the the stride length is limited, and you think that's the issue, maybe you will coach some longer stride length in an athlete who has a limited range of motion at the pelvis and at the thighs. And right. so maybe you will have issues of injuries with this athlete because he will try to give you what you asked. He will try to have longer strides where in fact, structurally his body cannot. And so yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to come up to your expectation as a coach, he will end up being injured because of you know, putting too much constraint on his system. But if you yes. realize that the short length, the short strides are related to this lack of range of motion, you will work with a physiotherapist on the range of motion and ho, oh, he, he will have uh, longer strides. So again, it's always, where is the limiting factor for this objective? And sometimes it's range of motion. I have worked with basketball young people. Believe me, they were not able to flex their knee 90 degrees without raising the heel. So it means yep. they had a crazy stiff ankle system. And so they had a, a very short range of motion at the ankle. And mm. if you say you will jump higher by improving your strength and you go to the gym and you strengthen the guys, you will not unlock the limiting factor. You will just yeah. boost. You know, it's like you have one foot on the brake and you keep on accelerating. This yeah. is one solution. This is one solution that will, that will basically ruin your motor. But the other solution is to lift the brake, the foot on the brake. This is exactly the way to see things. Try and see the limiting factors. It's always capacity versus constraint. You can work on improving your capacity a lot, 
you can also focus on reducing the constraints on your system. And I think most of the time, SNC is more on the pushing the capacity, capacity. Yeah. Yeah. not enough on reducing the constraints. That's the idea. Yeah, I love that. And both from a injury prevention, but also uh, performance too, to get those benefits, um, to be able to access those angles, you're going to be able to jump higher and, and run faster yeah. and, 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 and potentially prevent overload. And to complete the anecdote, in this young guy, at the end of the first session, he was the only guy in the team for which I said, you won't go to do the gym program with the others. You will go first yep. to work with the therapist on unlocking that ankle. And he was like, yes, but why? And I said, look, believe me, let's see us back in four weeks. He was jumping higher because yeah, he was, and he didn't go to the gym, but he was able to run up better and to move better into his jump because of this uh, better range of motion. So that's the idea. And I think maybe if he had done the gym program, maybe he would have jumped higher but that wouldn't have solved the, 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 the ankle issue. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's um, yeah, absolutely love, love hearing that. And it, it takes courage to be able to make those bold decisions in, in that environment. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, uh, that's great to hear that you, you did that and, and the athlete bought into it and, and um, it always helps when you get a good result as well. So did the, did the, were there some other athletes that, um, that you've worked with in the past that, that don't buy in and, and, and how do you go about trying to work with that situation? So the other, I don't, I don't coach anymore because of my, my, my academic work, but when I was doing physical prep in basketball, yep. the funny thing is that I was doing some foot and ankle strengthening exercises, routines, you know, some players didn't buy that. They, they were like, come on, it's, we need to jump. We need to, to, to skip and so on. And I said, yes, but we are working on strengthening the, the point of force transfer and blah, blah, blah. And one day, one of the guys went to the, I had a major um, ankle sprain. Okay. So he went, he went to the physiotherapist, a uh, very good physio working with his hands, you know, and so on. And when he came back, he said, oh, you know what? We did some of the exercises you were uh, suggesting at the beginning of the season and blah, blah, blah for my rehab. And I said, look, uh, what do you think? It was useful for the rehab. So it's exactly the same philosophy. There is no rehab or physical prep. There is strengthening yeah. your foot and ankle. So, and then at that moment, he was like, okay, but it took him an ankle sprain to come back to something that, that made sense right from the beginning. So yeah. this is, I would say, the costly, it's the costly way to, to buy in and to realize things is, is when you have issues. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and what about for your own um, knowledge and, and craft at the moment? You mentioned you, you're into your, you know, obviously the academic side, all the research that you've done. Um, how do you keep yourself at the top of your game? What are some of your favorite ways to upskill your knowledge? Well, I think social media, well, well, well used social media is, uh, is really interesting. Uh, when you mix um, Twitter and Instagram to see who is doing what and following, you know, uh, uh, good coaches and good professionals. I think it's a good way, yeah. uh, yes. but definitely the, the other way is to read. Uh, I mean, you, you have to read papers and you have to be aware of, if you hit the keywords, uh, sprint, soccer, rugby, hamstring, uh, on PubMed and you receive the alerts on that, you get something like a hundred papers a week. So of course, not all of them are interesting, but at least every week there's one or two papers out that you need to, to see and read to, to update knowledge. And the second thing is that I try to keep my hands on the motor. So practicing myself, uh, new exercises, new ideas. I'm, I'm very often at the gym trying some stuff and mm -hmm. um, uh, connecting with athletes very often. Uh, this is very important. For example, when I do a workshop or when I teach now, I refuse to do a teaching session if there is no practice. I need people to move and, and see them and discuss and interact around how people move. This is very important. And, and what about JB? When, when you're interested in a topic and, you, and you've discovered something that um, you're passionate about, how do you come about finding those things? Is it because in the practical sense, when you're working with athletes, you feel like you, you know, um, oh, that's an area that I'm lagging in and I want, and I want to work on, or uh, is it more just as you're doing, you're going about your research and you, and the routines that you're in, 
um, that starts to just come naturally out of just interest in the in your research. Honestly, I think that eighty percent of the of the major novel ideas that we have tested in the past came from uh, our own practice or our own interactions with coaches, not from the conclusion of a previous study that says it would be interesting to test that. I don't say that yeah. it's not uh, it's not the case, but I would say that. 20% of our research ideas come actually from previous research, but the, the vast majority comes from interacting with people. And this is why um, having Jordan Mendiguccia as a, as a collaborator and friend is, is key because uh, every week he comes up with a new player that he has treated and that, you know, uh, uh, came with a new ID. And then we, we want to test this new ID. That's the... That's the common point. Yeah, yeah. Solving problems for us. That's, yes. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> and that's, that's, also, that's also a good way to, to, to track and, and research some things that make sense. I don't say that everything that coaches do makes sense and research does not. But I say sometimes hypotheses uh, come for a reason. It's because mm. they come from repeated observations. And I always say that the the experience and the view on the topic of a coach that has 40 years of experience to my eyes is as important as the conclusion of a, an academics who has never really done what he's talking about honestly yes. and uh, so this is very important i don't say the field is right and academics are wrong i say sometimes mm. we need to start from the field questions because they really make sense mm. Yeah, and, and because that's that, the, um, because that practice based evidence, and I think it's important. Yeah, that integration. Um, that's um, it's something that in your career have you seen those collaborations starting to come more and more in, in research where people are looking to learn from the those practicing in the field and, and vice versa, those practicing in the field are starting to lean on more people in research. Um, I definitely think that the field is, uh, is more and more uh, research friendly and research uh, uh, aware and open. This is clear. I am not really convinced over the past 20 years that uh, academia and research has opened up to field uh, uh, possibilities and field ideas. I very often see academics, you know, very, very... Uh, narrow-minded against uh, ideas that come from the field like mm -hmm. you know there is no research evidence on that so this is not uh, a possibility uh, it's a uh, this is something that really needs to be to be improved and, and why do you think that is the case uh, uh, that might be also the case because some, some people go through the academic career with, uh, they start in the masters, then they do a PhD, then they become professors and researchers. And, uh, and, and sometimes they don't have enough connections with the field itself, uh, you know, from the yeah. beginning. Yep. And the academic word and the, you know, it's, it's a frenzy, it's crazy and so on. So if you don't have that connection, if, if you don't work on it, then uh, you have a risk of being, you know, revolving around the orbit of, of academic word and, and, and never touching the ground. This is very, I think this is one explanation. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it makes sense. You get, you can, you can easily get stuck in your, in your own world, can't you? And if, if you don't understand something, then um, sure. not, that it would, not that it would be a threat, but it, it might just be something that you, you're so busy in, in your own work that it's not relevant to, to what you're doing. Yeah. What, what about your yeah. own, your own personal challenges what are some of the biggest challenges you've had over the last sort of 20 years and and what did you grow and learn from it uh, i don't know what uh, one of the challenges is exactly what we've just discussed uh trying to make my my colleagues my students understand the fact that you know uh sometimes very interesting ideas uh, actually come from outside of academia this is important yep and, um, and vice versa, trying to make coaches understand that sometimes good ideas come from research and academia. So I try to, to have both, you know, people understand uh, each other's uh, positions. The only, the only limitation is that 
uh, research is assessed by academia uh, and by academia only. And so sometimes it's a bit difficult to publish some, some works that are trying to open some hypothesis because uh, academia sometimes is a very conservative uh, word. Well, high level sports as well. <laughs> so if you want yeah. to open up to new ideas and possibilities, then you're gonna have to fight uh, conservatism and, and uh, inertia. Yep. And we'll move to more of the personal side, the get to know you segment of the podcast, uh, JB. So this is a, the, the easier questions, I guess, a bit of a lighter touch. Um, the first one is what movie or TV series or, or book um, has impacted you the most and, and why? Well, I'm not, I'm not a very, very intense uh, series watcher. I watch some, but, you know, they, I would say they come and go. I was very, yeah. very, uh, I was very, very, you know, passionate with two movies when I was younger. One was uh, Back to the Future. And I think that's, that's a classic uh, in, in my generation, but it's exactly this, you know, testing crazy things outside and, uh, and doing some sci-fi stuff. Uh, the other one yeah. was um, uh, Once Upon a Time in America. Uh, it was very, very, um, I was really uh, marked by this movie. It was very intense how very, you know, young people develop and go through their own path in, uh, in, in America. So that was my yep. two major uh, influences. And in terms, in terms of reading, I'm really passionate about uh, historical, uh, you know, uh, history of science books. So most of them are in French. But when you read the, the life of, uh, of uh, Galileo or the life of, uh, you know, very big names in science, Da Vinci and so on, uh, that's really interesting how they connected because they did some groundbreaking scientific works in the era of we have no device, we have no technology. Yeah. And so I don't yeah, say amazing. that modern science is, is rubbish, but at the time they had just wood sticks and, and paper. Uh, they, they, you know, they computed things and they, they did some crazy stuff. And so that's in the historical books. Yeah, yeah, genius. And what about on, on that note, inspiration? Um, what, what is your favorite inspirational quote or life motto? Uh, I don't know. I love the fact that uh, the, the idea of uh, if it's not sure, at least it's a maybe. I love that because it means, uh, you know. <laughs> and the second thing is, at worst, it doesn't work. This is, I love that because you, you will try some stuff. And, and sometimes it will not work and, and sometimes it will. And so mm. if you start with this thing in mind, uh, I think you have a very positive journey. Yeah, giving things a shot. Yeah, I think it's, the, I think it's, it's, it's very simple to say that, but uh, sometimes uh, uh, people tend to forget that, you know, why not? And uh, let's yeah, see, why not? before, before yeah. we say, it's a yes or it's a no. Let's go with it's a maybe. That's a, that's yeah. a positive way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great outlook. There's a lot of gray, isn't there? <laughs> and we yeah, yeah. To, we and, then, to, yeah. and then sometimes it's uh, it's some things that make sense a few years after uh, don't, but at least uh, yeah. we've tried and we've we've tested. Mm -hmm. And what about in your work life? What are, what are your pet peeves? What what makes you angry? Uh, I think the the most exciting part of my work is to is to is the field testing. What what information can we collect uh, accurately without being at the lab? This is interesting. I do some lab research and I supervise some lab research, clearly. But it's really interesting to see um, how can we use classical information to get some uh, new new type of information. That that's 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 really interesting. That's your interest, yeah. So, sorry, I, I might have not explained the question well enough. Um, so, what do you, what is your pet peeves? What makes you angry? So, when you're in your work life, when you're um, running some research or you're working in the field, and it might be an athlete that does something that you you, you know um, they might rock up late to training, or maybe someone's oh, been I mean, a bit okay. What what makes yeah. me angry? Not yeah, angry. angry. Yeah, okay, no, no, so no, yeah, I agree. honestly, <laughs> honestly, uh, less and less uh, things make me really mad because I'm yeah. 
I'm a live and let die type of guy now. The only thing that that really uh, makes me crazy is uh, unfairness, uh, unfairness of arguments, unfairness of comments, and um, unfairness of assessment. Like uh, you, you, uh, you, yes, personal bias that leads to unfairness. If if some comments are fair and sound, I totally accept and agree. Sometimes yeah. unfair decisions are really it's the last thing I I I cannot let go. So mm -hmm. so as 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 for the athlete or if an athlete doesn't do or doesn't respect an instruction or whatever, honestly, I have a, a comment like if a student is using his phone during my class, I will have a comment yeah. and 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 just kick him out of the room. But that doesn't make me uh, my my heart rate doesn't move. I don't care. <laughs> but uh, unfairness is something I, I can't I can't stand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's and that makes a lot of sense. If you know, um, that's something I definitely agree with, and I think it no doubt everyone um, would resonate with that. Um, if you're putting energy and time into something, and and you care about something, you want that to be mutual. Absolutely. That's that's an example. Is when you you put energy and time in developing twenty years of research on something. And someone comes without experience and with you know unfair or wrong arguments, and yeah. influences the fact that your paper is rejected or or you see what I mean. So this is this is this is tough, but I mean yes, it's, it's the game. Uh, yeah, yeah, unfortunately. And and what about um, what's a fa your favorite way to spend your day off? You sound like you're a busy guy. You, you may not have a lot of days off, but um, what would be your favorite thing if you were, if you'd okay, so, so if my wife doesn't listen to the podcast, I will say cycling. <laughs> <I'll> <laughs> but, uh, yep. No, days days off are really are really around uh, moving around, uh, hiking, and, and doing sports. Um, the good thing with kids uh, growing up is that they come really good sports partners. So playing sports with kids yep. is uh, is uh, is good. And going around in in the outdoors. I'm not a very I'm a country guy. I'm not a very uh, mm -hmm. urban guy. So mm -hmm. day off means what's the weather like, and let's let's do something. Yeah. And what about your favorite holiday destination uh, in a COVID-free world? Where would you love to be? Uh, I, I would love to be in uh, in places that are not too crowded. So um, I really like Italy. Uh, so. A coast somewhere around the the Italy uh, coast uh, parts is really cool. I love that country. They that's really calm and 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 very very relaxing. So that would be mm -hmm. the destination. Yeah, yeah, very good. It's uh, definitely on my list. Italy. Um, I've heard very good things about it, and, and it's probably been a popular country. I think in in all the guests yeah. that I've had. Um, we, it's going to be a longer trip for you than for me. Hey. It's going to be longer trip for you than than for me. Oh, absolutely, that. absolutely. <laughs> um, we've talked a lot about your, your early on in your career and, and and the research and the work that you've done on the field. What are some of the things you're excited about at the moment? Um, what are some some passion projects that you're working on? And and take us through some things that you've you're working on for the rest of the year. So the two things uh, that are really interesting for me right now is the. One thing is on the hamstring injury uh, side with um, a very um, multifactorial uh, prevention process that we've started a, a couple of years ago and see and see if it helps better preventing injuries. That's for one. Mm -hmm. And the second one is the use of GPS data to um, analyze what we call the in-situ profile of the players. Uh, it's a new way to analyze the GPS speed and acceleration data. And we want to mm -hmm. see how it relates to classical single sprint uh, profiles and how it relates to anything, fatigue, performance, injuries, and, and everything that can be done. So we've just published a proof of concept uh, paper. And so by definition, okay. after a proof of concept paper has been published, it's a, uh, let's go and investigate. Uh, that sounds really interesting. So what exactly are you looking at with the GPS when it comes to acceleration and, and velocity? So, so we we accumulate um, some GPS data over uh, sessions or sessions plus games or even weeks of data, 
if the GPS data is accurate enough, we have a cloud of data that has um, a kind of a triangle relationship between acceleration and speed. As you know, mm -hmm. when you run faster, you're not able to accelerate and vice versa. Yes. And the top end, the top end of this triangle gives us a kind of a profile, and that's going to be the speed acceleration profile of the player. So that, that was the just the new way to, to analyze this data. And then we can see if it changes depending on the position, depending on, I don't know, ongoing injuries, depending on the tactical uh, instruction of the coaches and so on. Yeah, and how to prepare them for their, the way they play. Yeah, then the most exciting part of this concept is that you collect the data and for the players, it's a totally passive way of, of being tested because you don't test, you just, they, they generate right. the data anyway. So it's, it's just yeah. a matter of, Reanalyzing the data uh, that have been collected. Yeah, right, that's great. And so, to get a, a better understanding of 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 that triangle relationship, are you looking at um, an athlete's profile? Are they someone that does sprint a lot and do a lot of high velocity work, and then another athlete that doesn't actually get exposed to max velocity, but they do a lot of acceleration? Um, what about density? Is that something that you're looking to account as well, like work rate? Yeah, so that, that's one of the questions we have. We need enough, enough type of exercises all along the, the, the spectrum to get a sound yep. cloud of data. So sometimes we have some, some data clouds that have no uh, enough data on the maximum velocity side and some not enough data on the maximum acceleration side. So that's, I would say, we need to be sure that uh, the player has given maximum efforts in all the speed zones. And so... Mm. That can take 30 minutes. I can do a 30 minute effort in playing football and, and filling all the zones of my cloud. Uh, that can take two weeks of data. So that, that's part mm. of, the, of the research that we are now uh, performing. Ah, it sounds really interesting. So watch this space, eh? so, and it's about to be published. Yeah, yeah I hope that's gonna be the next, uh, the next year's uh, papers by, by my team, but also by other teams. And uh, we are collaborating already with people trying to implement that uh, that approach and on the sports science gps <laughs> what do you think what do you think would be um what's coming in that space what what are some objective measures obviously gps gps has been around for some time and they're getting more reliable um but are they get is there something new in the work in the works that you think will start to be an elite sport yeah i think the i think the next the next steps will be an an, an improvement in the accuracy of the systems because uh, not all systems are accurate enough today to correctly assess uh, maximum acceleration movements. So when the speed is stable and you have maximum speed, but the, the change in speed is very, very small, mm. most systems today are accurate enough, but when the speed is changing very fast and with a very high magnitude of change, some systems are still not able to track that correctly. And to track that correctly when there is an, uh, you know, when the weather is not correct, when the quality of the signal is not correct. So I think maybe the next the next frontier is to get really accurate data in more uh, conditions. Right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and and that's something that you think that will will be in you know in action in the next sort of five years, ten years. How long do you think that that type of work takes? I don't know. I don't know. Really, it's uh, I'm not into the the hardcore uh, technology uh, side of things, so I really don't know. Yeah. I hope it will yeah. be in less than few years, but we'll wait and see. Well, thank you so much for your time tonight, today in in France, and tonight here in Australia. I really appreciate it, JB. It's been amazing to have you on and 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 share your expertise and your, your knowledge, both in the practical field and how you apply that re your research um, and the work that you've, you've done over the last 20 years. Are, you know, thank you so much for your time and sharing and being so open, open and honest with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Jack, and I uh, hope people will like it. Oh, they absolutely will. Yeah, thank you, JB. Thanks for everyone that's tuned in and um, I'll make sure that I'll update our next live chat very shortly. Cheers, guys.